Good morning and happy Easter. You know, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, one of the things that came to mind is I, when I was a kid, Easter was never one of my favorite holidays. And, and, and it's for an interesting reason that Easter became so problematic to me. You see, Easter was the Sunday, always on a Sunday, and it was always a Sunday when I had to go to church. You see, in my family, we went to church every Sunday, but Easter was the one holiday that always ended up on Sunday. And I remember as a kid, I didn't understand why Easter had to be on Sunday. Like, it would have been much more productive for me if we did Easter on Saturday, so it didn't get broken up with me having to go to the boring church service. You see, I had a very, very secular view of Easter when I was a kid. So Easter went like this for us. We would wake up first thing in the morning, we would open our Easter baskets that were by our bed, we would eat some of the candy, and then we would have to get dressed. And then we'd go to church and sit through an hour of Bible class, and an hour and a half of a worship service, and a, and a sermon, and then we would go home, and finally, sometime during that day, we would finally get to, to the part of, oh, we're looking for the eggs that had been hidden by the Easter Bunny throughout our property. I didn't get the significance of Easter when I was a kid. I didn't understand what it represented. And I think today, we may fall into that same trap in a different way. You see, today marks Easter Sunday, and it's probably the first Sunday that some of you, first Easter Sunday that you, some of you are not attending a church service. You know, you didn't get up this morning and get dressed and, and get in the car and drive to a church service. You got up this morning, some of you didn't even really get dressed, and you turned on the TV to watch this video to see if, if somehow some encouragement would come your way that would make you feel less weird uh, during this very difficult time. And, I, and I'm hoping to do that, but I want to, you to understand that your view of Easter is as skewed as my view of Easter. You see, you think of Easter Sunday as the time when you go to church. And, and I've been reading this on Facebook this week, and I'll be honest with you, I don't think I've really embraced it until now. But Easter is not about us going to church. Easter is not about attending the church service for the year. Easter is about us celebrating an empty tomb, a victorious king. You see, Easter, you can celebrate that in your churches, and you can celebrate it right where you are today. And I think it, if we can really wrap our minds around the, 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 the truth of the resurrected king, it will not only give us peace in the now, it will give us peace in this pandemic. You see, we don't serve a dead king or a dead messiah. We serve a risen king. And so... I want us to kind of unpack this today, and, I, and I'm glad that you're watching this video today. I, I, I think it will be an encouragement to you, but I want to tell you about this king. I want to tell you about this Jesus, and I want to start in Luke chapter 9. You see, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus had just fed 5,000 people, which is one of the things Jesus did, right? Jesus could take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 people. G Jesus could take some mud and, 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 and get it wet with his spit and put it on the eyes of a blind man and he could be able to see. Jesus could say, rise up and walk, and people would walk. You see, Jesus was something else. But right after Jesus fed the 5,000, he asked his disciples, he says, who do men say that I am? Or who do the crowds say that I am? And, and, and they replied, some say John the Baptist. I'm in Luke chapter 9, verse 18. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, still others, uh, one of the prophets from long ago that's come back to life. And he says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And depending on what version you read in, in Luke's gospel, he says, Peter answers, the Christ of God. And in, in I think Matthew's gospel, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and no matter which version you read, Peter is making a, a proclamation about Jesus that that he should hold on to you see he is declaring that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised who would usher in a new kingdom who would usher in this this new reality who would deal with the sins of the world like this is the Jesus that had been prophesied that over 300 prophecies had been spoken of that he had fulfilled but Jesus does something really interesting he doubles down 
on that statement. Listen to what he says in Luke chapter 9, verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. And I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you up front that Peter and the other disciples sitting there didn't get what he was saying. They, they thought he was speaking uh, figuratively, maybe. I don't know what they thought, but it didn't register with him, both of those statements, because they didn't want to believe that Jesus would be killed, first and foremost, and they really didn't believe that Jesus could be resurrected. And so they needed Jesus to stay and do what he's doing in the way that they expected him to do it, so that he could, they could enjoy this peace that comes from our own semblance of normality. And so what's interesting is Jesus actually says to them, look, the Son of Man, me, has to be killed, rejected by the chief priests and the Pharisees, killed, and then on the third day to be raised alive. Now that, that's a bold statement. That's a bold statement that, that I think a lot of us dismiss. Jesus predicted his own death, predicted his own resurrection. And so if he doesn't show up, if it doesn't happen, then, then Jesus is, is a liar. You know, and then, then I remember C.S. Lewis once said that, that you, you have to make a decision about Jesus. He's either lunatic, liar, or Lord. Like, you, you, you can't come to any other conclusion. He's either lunatic, liar, or he's Lord. And, and if he's a lunatic, you can dismiss him. If he's a liar, you can berate him. But if he's Lord, you should probably hear him. And so I started this by talking about hating going to church and that some of you are hating that you can't go to church today. But I hope that by the end of this lesson, you will recognize that Jesus came not to give us a Sunday church service, but to give us a life that he himself ushered in through his resurrected body. And so we're going to jump over to John chapter 20, if you have your Bibles. And, and I love John's narrative about this because we see a lot of what happens to us. So John starts saying in John chapter 20, verse 1, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that would be John, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Now, let's just stop real quick, because it's interesting to me that Mary goes up to the tomb. She didn't go to check and see if Jesus had fulfilled his prophecy. She didn't go and see if maybe, just maybe, that uh, Jesus had walked out of the tomb. There's several things you need to understand right here. Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and Joanna, who all went to the tomb. Luke, to, Luke gives us those three who went to the tomb. All of them went to the tomb expecting to find a dead Jesus. They, they, had, they did not for a moment believe that Jesus had raised from the dead. Here's one of the things I kind of a side note if, if, you're, if you really want to think about this. They, their actions prove that they were surprised by what happened. And it certainly proves that they didn't do it. You know, there, there are three theories out there uh, about the resurrection. Because very few historians discount the historical reality of Jesus. And so there's, there's three theories about how the tomb was empty. You know, it's really interesting. Most historians accept that Jesus was a real person. Most historians accept that Jesus was killed uh, on, on a cross. Most historians accept that he went into a tomb. Most historians accept that the tomb was empty. And so they have to come up with a way to, to, to explain how Jesus wasn't in the tomb. And so one of the explanations was somebody stole him. Somebody went in and took his body so that they could postulate this idea that he had rose from the dead. Well, the most likely people to have done that would have been the people who were closest to him. The people who were, who were trying to establish this new faith system, this new religious system, if you, were, if you will. And so... The first one is, is they went in and they stole him to set up this whole thing. The, the second idea is that Jesus really wasn't dead, that he had just swooned. That he, it's called the swoon theory, that um, 
when they took him off the cross, he really wasn't dead. They put him in the tomb, and then he walks out of the tomb on his own power. And, and the final theory, which is the accurate theory, is that he really did rise from the dead, fulfilling his own prophetic word that he says in Luke chapter 9. And so I just, uh, the reason I kind of wanted to lay that out there is because I want you to see that when Mary goes to the tomb, she's going to prepare his body. There wasn't time on Friday to prepare his body. She's going to finish the process of burying uh, her Messiah, or burying her rabbi. She's going through the process. That's what she's going to do. And when she gets there and sees that the stone is rolled away, her first reaction isn't that Jesus is raised from the dead. That's not her first reaction. Her first reaction is, I don't know what's happened. And I need to go tell Peter and John so maybe they can help me solve this conundrum that Jesus isn't here. And so she runs back and she tells John, we'll pick up in verse 3. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in uh, at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had, received, who had uh, reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Did you, did you catch that part? They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And so after they come in and they see this, their next action is quite interesting. They run back away. The disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white seated from uh, where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this they turned around and saw Jesus. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? I love this. You know, one of the things I think that we miss when we read scripture is the, the true humanity of, of Jesus. And, you know, we, we get the deity and we recognize that he is the son of God and we proclaim that and we worship him as well we should. But it's in moments like this that we also see the, 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 the humanity of Jesus. He, he walks up and he says, woman, why are you crying? And then he, he asks this interesting question. He's like, who are you looking for? You know, it's, I, just, I just find it so uh, humorous because Jesus is almost like, hmm, who are you looking for there? And, and of course, he's who she's looking for. And she's, she's crying and thinking that he was a gardener. She said, sir, if, if, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and, and I'll go get him. Like, who are you looking for? Why are you crying? I'm not even going to answer that question. You know who I'm looking for. And if you've taken him, tell me where you put him. Tell me what you did with him so I can go take care of him. So I can go take care of the dead Jesus. And then he says, Mary. I love this scene. Because there's nothing more personal than for somebody to proclaim your name, to say your name. Mary. And at this, she recognized the voice. She recognized the tenor of, his, of, of the way he said his name. He, she recognized him. And so she says, Rabbi, or Rabboni, which means teacher. And then Jesus says, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go and stood to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and my God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them uh, that he had said these things to her. So there's a, there's a lot going on here. But one of the things I want you to see is that nobody was expecting to find a risen Savior. They were all expecting to find a corpse. And so much so that even when he was gone, they had theories about what happened. And their first theory was somebody has taken him. Somebody has taken him for whatever reason. They don't know the reason, but somebody has taken him. And 
Mary sticks around. You see, one of the things that happens to us in this life is we tend to be more like Peter and John. You know, they came in, they saw he was gone, and then they just left. But you see, Mary gets still. And she stays there. And she's crying. And Jesus approaches her. It's such a beautiful scene that, that I think if we really, really took a moment and thought about it, one of the reasons that we don't experience what God has for us is because we keep running. We keep, we keep running to this and, and we keep running to this conclusion and we keep running to this solution and, and we have a tendency to miss the glory of God. We miss this opportunity where we get to, we get to hear him say our name. And so on this Easter Sunday, I know you don't get to show up at church, but one of the things you can do is you can be still before God. You, you, can, you can wait and, and, and listen for the voice of God. Because we don't serve a dead Messiah. We serve a risen King. And here's the cool thing about that. He not only gave his life, he took it up again. In fact, the, the passage that's right behind you says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will have life. John eleven twenty five. 25. And, and, and I know that in this very difficult time that we're living in right now, it feels like everything has ended. It feels like there's no end in sight for what we're experiencing. And so I want to give you a couple of encouraging words this morning. I want you to know that because we serve a risen king, we don't have to act like the world acts. We don't have to be afraid of what this all means or what, the, what has been taken from us or, or what we're going to have to endure. We serve a risen king. And we know that he can make a promise like all things work together for the good of those who love him or are called according to his purpose. We can put our hope and our trust in the reality of what God is doing. And so I want to make a little bit of a confession. I've not done a good job of this. I've become very frustrated by what we're having to endure. I've become very skeptical about what we're being told. And the truth of the matter is, is I don't have to live there. I, I don't have to live in this, in this constant state of angst and anxiety. I, I don't have to live in this constant state of uncertainty and fear. I, I don't have to live in this state of, of worry. I can live in the reality that I serve a king who not only predicted his death, predicted his resurrection, and then was able to accomplish it. And so when I think about that, I can also rest assured that he is able to deliver me. I don't have to be focused on the, the, the things of this life. In fact, Jesus says in this life, you will have trouble. In this life, in this world, you will have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the even death. I know that some of you are struggling, and I pray that today, on Easter Sunday, you will be given a new life in Christ Jesus, that you will recognize that we serve a king that even the grave couldn't hold. And I pray that this Resurrection Sunday will be a reminder that we don't have to be afraid of anything. With God on our side, what can man do to us? So I want to leave you with the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 after he makes this unbelievable case for the resurrected king. Here's what he says. He says, When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, uh, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of God is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor of the Lord is not in vain. And we know this because he gave us new life in Christ Jesus. And he proved it by being raised from the dead. So on this Resurrection Sunday, don't be, don't be filled with turmoil.
because you're not in a church. Be filled with joy because our king is not in a tomb. God bless you. I hope you have a great Easter. I pray that, that God will move you in a new way, that we will become lights in a dark world, that we don't become part of the problem, but we become part of the answer. I, I know that God is doing some amazing things during this time, and, and I know that he is bringing victory where defeat seems certain, and I know that he is bringing uh, truth where lies have prevailed. And this Easter Sunday, let us celebrate that we serve a risen Savior who conquers everything, including death. And he's promised to make you and I more than conquerors. Let's be lights in this very difficult time. And let's shine like stars in the sky. God bless you all and have a wonderful Easter Sunday.